told us rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. And I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, does not light a candle and sweep diligently the house and seek it with diligence until she find it. And when she, when she had found it, <clears throat> she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. May the Lord's richest blessing be to his word. May we thank in our hearts. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we're so grateful one more time to be with your people in this house to sing songs and lift our voices in praise and adoration and thanksgiving. We lift our voices to collect as a church in prayer. And now for this time that you've given us, Lord, to gather around the word of the Lord. Speak to your people today. Bring encouragement. Bring hope. Bring deliverance. Bring peace. Bring direction. Whatever your people need, Father, you know how to customize your word to the needs of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to speak this morning from an obvious title of rejoicing over finding something that was lost. Rejoicing over finding something that was lost. I spoke earlier about the elder of this church, the late Benjamin Tolliver. And Ben had these two washing machines and these two dryers, both that functioned. But instead, a couple of times a week, he took the laundry of he and Mother Mary and the children who were still at home at the time, and he went to the East End to the laundromat there several times every week. And I approached him one day about it. <clears throat> I said, Elder, I have one question. Why would you leave the convenience of your home with two washers and two dryers, water and electricity? Load your clothes in that van. There was always question as to whether or not it was going to make it off that hill. It would make it off the hill, wasn't going to make it back. And then go around and spend money in those washing machines and dryers to wash your clothes. He said, well, brother pastor, you don't understand. He said, when you find a good fishing hole, you don't leave it. When you find a good fishing hole, you don't leave it. So the laundromat on the east end was his spiritual fishing hole. Now, some of y'all know where the laundromat was. I think they've torn it down now. It was right there on Washington Street. I mean, it was in the major thoroughfare. And the least the last, the lost, left out and left behind, and those who didn't have a washing machine or a dryer or water in the house, <clears throat> They came to the East End laundromat to wash their clothes. And Ben Tolliver held evangelism one-on-one several times a week there, witnessing and sharing his faith and trying to win people to Christ. The best evangelist I've ever known, the best soul winner I've ever known was Ben Tolliver. So the spirit of Ben Tolliver sort of came in my mind yesterday. And I went over to the Martin Luther King Jr. Center. A friend of mine was having an event, asked me to come over and say the prayer, try to encourage the kids. They had this junior NBA skills contest, and he had brought his delegation down from the northern part of the state. And so I had one of my grandsons, and he and I went over there. And so while I'm there, guess who I saw? Who came up to see me? And here's what he said to me. He says, Pastor Matthew, Matthew Watts, Pastor Matthew Watts, Great Bible Church. Ben Tolliver is dead. Jeremiah. You longtime Grace Bible Church people, y'all know who Jeremiah was. A special needs kid that Murray and uh, Brother Ben had. 
for years, and Joe Michael was with us on the East Stand, and Joe Michael's a grown man now. It's kind of hard to see him, not hard to see him, but now you see him, he's got a little bit of gray coming in on, on, on the ends and so forth. I had not seen Joe Michael in several years. He walked up to me, and I was talking to somebody. He looked at them and looked at me, and he says, that's Pastor Matthew Watts, Grace Bible Church, and Ben Collins is there. That was powerful. It almost brought tears to my eyes to think that this boy, this young man, carries around in his mind and on his heart Ben Tolliver. And every time I would suggest, every time he probably encounters someone associated with Grace Bible Church, he immediately thinks about Ben Tolliver because he lived at Grace Bible Church. Because every time Ben was there, Joe Michael was going to be there for Sunday school, Sunday service. We had Sunday evening service at the time, Wednesday night. Bible study, prayer meeting, Joe Michael was going to be there. And it just, I was so moved. I see here, though he is dead, Brother Ben, yet he's still speaking. Yet he's still speaking. And so when I was there and Joe Michael brought Ben back to my mind, I realized that God has got me here today because the Lord has took me to a water hole, a fishing pond. That I didn't realize was filling so many fish, Brother Daddy. I hadn't had a chance to brief you on this yet. So this is how this thing came about. They were looking for a place for the NBA Skills Challenge. The young lady down at the North Charleston Community Center, I'd worked with her when uh, Brother Rick Martin and I was trying to save the West Side Youth Football League, and we volunteered to be the commissioners. We saved the league. We kept them from shutting it down. We got them through an election, and then they fired us. That's the second time I've been fired after doing a great job. I didn't cross legs back 20 years or so ago. The coach walked out the first day of practice. They didn't have no basketball coach. Bob Maxwell and I agreed to coach the team. We coached the A.J. middle school team, took them to a championship that they almost never win, won the championship, then they fired us. <laughs> didn't renew our contract because some teacher decided they wanted that little stipend that they uh, were going to receive because we had a good team that year and had a good group of seventh graders coming up, going to be eighth graders. So twice we have delivered in a major fashion, but we still got fired at the end of the situation. But this young lady, she didn't forget. I sent them to North Charleston. You go over and you ask Miss Jennifer, she'll work with us. She'll move mountains to help us make this thing work. Well, they moved Miss Jennifer to where? The King Center. So then they went over to the King Center and they said, well, Reverend Watts said that you would help us. Now, my name got some cachet at that level, down at the grassroots level, even the city of Charleston. So she immediately made it happen, went over and made the pitch and, and got the city to agree to do it, underwrite it. We didn't have to have insurance. They would sponsor, wouldn't, wouldn't charge anything. So that's how I ended up at the King Center. So at the King Center, first I see John Michael. Then I see, and I'm not going to call their names, but I saw several people that I'm going to assign them to members of this church. Young people, I thought they had moved because they told me they were going to move. <laughs> and somebody else told me that they were going to move. They haven't moved from nowhere. They still live in South Charleston, and one of them still live here on the west side. And I said, well, where in the world y'all been? Good to see y'all back. Y'all come back to visit. They said, visit? We ain't been nowhere. <laughs> I said, this is my fishing hole for my own lost sheep, for my own lost members who I thought had moved out of state, and they haven't moved out of state. I said, well, where are you going to church? They said, Rev, you know we wouldn't be nowhere but with you. I said, well, you ain't been in a long time because I ain't seen you so long, but I'm glad to see you. I found a fishing hole. So I'm not talking to a few people. And uh, one of the questions I always ask people, I said, when do you go to church? After we talked for a few minutes. And when they start the story, well, Reverend, <laughs> and I figured out how to respond to that. I said, let me tell you what to do. I said, the next time someone have asked you that question, where do you go to church? I want you to respond immediately, Grace Bible Church. And if you come one Sunday and I see you and fill the visitor's card, I'll write your name down. And if they call to check, I say, yeah, they, they go to Grace Bible Church. I say, so you, you, you officially got a church. Now, Grace Bible Church, you don't, they're not associated with one. You don't go to one. Now you got one. I'm a found a fishing hole. 
there were four young professionals that I saw yesterday and saw one of them twice Friday evening and Saturday at the same one fishing hole, the King Center. So I had forgotten Miss Jennifer. You know, I've been talking about these foster care kids. Miss Jennifer, she's a young woman. She's probably only 35 years old. I don't know. I know she's not much older than that. But she became a foster parent. She got four teenage foster daughters that she's had for the last three or four years. I said, you the poster child I've been looking for. I've been looking for somebody that's serious about helping these foster children that we can rally some support around and, and try to encourage and show people that it can be done. I say, where are you going to church at? Well, Reverend, I, I used to go to Clendenin. I said, well, now you go to the Great Bible Church. Found a good fishing hole. And so then she said, well, I, I need your help, and I need some help from some of the men and women from the church. I said, help doing what? She says, I got about 15 or 20 teenagers. And, and they just kind of wreaking some havoc, but they're not bad kids. And so we're trying to start a little program. And every Thursday, if somebody could come over, y'all can talk with them and try to work with them. And, and she's like the, the, the Pied Piper. And come to find out now, her young uh, assistant is a young man by the name of Rashad. And everything was last name, but he's a very popular young rapper. He's made recordings and he came to talk to me a few times. I've tried to encourage him, point him in a direction to try to help him get his career launched. And he's a love the Lord, Christian guy, and trying to make good positive music. Well, now he's the system director. So now we got carte blanche access into the Martin Luther Kent King Center. Just right across the bridge, pretty much to do whatever we need to do in terms of trying to connect with people. So the spirit of Ben Tolliver kind of rose up inside of me on yesterday as I thought about how do we become a more effective witness for Jesus Christ? How do we build relationships with young people and with the parents and with key strategic people in the community to try to be a bridge to connect people to Jesus Christ? Are y'all following me? I'm not going to really be long this morning. I just want to lay out some, some thoughts this morning, and we'll finish up next week. As I was watching the news report from the situation down in Parkland, Florida, I couldn't take with so much. At some point, I just have to take, turn it off because I can't do nothing. It just, it just worries you. It just breaks your heart, but you can't do anything. But one of the things that was kind of amazing, I don't know how many of you heard those young people, 14, 15 years old. I'm talking about intelligent, articulate, poised, confident, talking with some authority and basically saying, look, Something's going to change around here. This is what they were saying. No, we're going to be voting in a couple of years. And some things are going to change around here. Now, regardless of whether you agree or disagree or whatever, I don't know exactly where they're going, but I tell you what, they got my attention. I stood up straight and listened to these young teenagers laying out their concern of feeling like that they're not being heard, that they're not really being protected the way they could be protected, and there needs to be some change coming. And they actually sent messages to the president and to the Congress, teenagers. And as I thought about listening to them, I said, oh, oh, Lord, where are the spiritual ones? And maybe some of those young people are. What a mighty army could be raised up to start lifting up the name of Christ and bringing in the Jesus factor as one of the key components of any strategy we're going to come up with to deal with violence that is the scourge in our society today. The Jesus factor has to be brought into the equation, and it's young people that have the credibility to bring in the Jesus factor as something that be considered. Because they're in the school. And so their First Amendment rights to free speech is protected in the school. And they can talk about Christ. You didn't know that, did you? That students can organize prayers, students can organize Bible studies inside the school, and it's protected by the United States Constitution. And the Supreme Court ruled on it several years ago under the Equal Access Law. And that's why Child Evangelism Fellowship, they can hold good news clubs at the end of the school day. And fellowship of Christian athletes can hold clubs during the school day. When the schools gather together for their club days, FCA or any other Christian group or religious group for that matter can have access as long as the effort is student-led. 
So as long as the students are leading the effort, they can get together for prayer and for Bible study and to observe the Lord's table. It's protected by the United States Constitution. And that's where the war is going to have to be won if we're going to turn the tide in our nation. It's raising up a generation of disciples, young people, children, particularly at the elementary and the middle school level where life really makes up his mind. But by the time people get to high school, they pretty much decided what they're going to do, right or wrong. But in those years, when they are still open to the adults talking to them, when they're still framing the way they're going to look at the world, if we can get them discipled, to look at the world through the lens of the Bible, we can have the army that we need to maybe hold off the impending disintegration of our society. The public school system in the United States of America is the number one and primary system for the socialization of, of individuals. If you look at the number of people are connected between students and between the teachers, and the school service personnel, there are 50 million people that are connected to the public school system every single day, five days out of week. 50 million that are connected. We got 325 million people in the whole country. That's a sizable portion of our population, and the majority of that 50 plus million is children. So that's a water hole. That's a pond. That's a fishing place that the church has to have a presence through the children and also through teachers and administrators who can certainly live out their faith. There's no law against them living out their faith in the public arena, in the public square. Are y'all listening to me? Well, let me anchor this in the scripture to set our thoughts for next week. Last week we talked about this subject of uh, why is it that the church and Christians are so mad and angry at sinners? Why are we angry at sinners for sinning? That's kind of in their job description. I sin because I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner, therefore I sin. And so as we shared last week, being angry at people and having vitriol at people and criticizing people and excoriating people, it's not going to open their heart or their mind to our presentation of the gospel. And so if we go back and look at Jesus of Nazareth, very early in his ministry, he establishes that he has a concern for the lost. He has a concern for those who are depicted and portrayed as sinners. It was very profound in Mark chapter 2 last week when the religious leaders criticized him to his disciples as to why does their teacher, their religious leader, why does he fraternize with publicans, with tax collectors, and with sinners. And Jesus' response was that they which are whole, those who are well, those who are spiritually healthy, they do not need a physician, but those who are spiritually sick, I came not to call the religious righteous to repentance, but sinners to repentance. And so all during his ministry, there was this ongoing conflict between he and the religious leaders because his willingness to fraternize to even have meals with people they viewed as sinners and their supposed commitment to this high moral spiritual level. And then Luke chapter 15, it probably reaches some apex. And I'll fully, more fully develop this next week as I give the background to Luke chapter 14. But I want to introduce the passage this morning. So 15.1 says, then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. So now his ministry now, it has reached a zenith in terms of popularity with the masses, with the grassroots people. And a lot of that has to do with what he had taught in chapter 14. And the Pharisees, true to form, their response was that they murmured among themselves, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now let me define to you how they use the term sinners. When they talked about sinners, they were not necessarily talking about people that were living in sexual morality or people that were criminals or robbers or things like that. That's not what they were talking about. The term that they used to describe sinners, the broad term, it was for anybody who didn't keep their rules and regulations. So anyone who didn't subscribe to the strict 
dietary laws that they had and the washing of hands and pots and utensils and all those things that they went through, this outward show of all this rigmarole and all this pomp and circumstance to draw attention to themselves as how spiritually and how righteous they were. Well, the common people didn't have time to do all of that, and it wasn't biblical anyhow. It was just tradition stuff that they had had it that they had added. So they called those people sinners. They viewed those people as being spiritually beneath them. And if the church isn't careful, we would do a similar thing. If the church really isn't careful, we would look at our church attendance, our Bible reading, our Wednesday night prayer meeting attendance, all those things that we can check the mark off on and check the mark off on and conclude that we're more spiritual than people that don't do those things. But if we look at how we deal with individuals in a personal relationship, how we serve, whether or not we sacrifice, whether or not we are giving, whether or not we are kind and loving and compassionate, whether or not we actually produce the fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness and temperance and faith. If someone does a spiritual fruit inspection, they might find that our tree is quite barren that there is no fruit on our spiritual trees. Now, that's something that we all must be concerned about and watch out for. We're not supposed to judge anybody, but we can inspect the fruit. Are they producing any spiritual fruit? If the FBI and the CIA, I still believe in the FBI and the CIA, by the way. I still believe, on point, they do some pretty good things. They, they keep us safe. And they pretty much good guys and good people, and they give their lives and put their life on the line to protect us. I, I, I still got confidence in them to a certain degree. I, I, I'm over J. Edgar Hoover now. He's been gone long enough. And I, I think his legacy has been taken care of. He got his name on the building in Washington. I can live with that, right? But his, 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 his great people, they're not running the show. So we got a whole new regime in. So if the FBI and the spiritual CIA, and if the Congress was to pass a law that says you cannot be a Christian in the United States of America, and we're going to evaluate and judge whether or not people are Christian by how closely they live to the tenets and the teachings and the preaching of Jesus of Nazareth. The question is, will they have enough evidence to arrest us? Would, would we get arrested? Would we be cited for living out our faith? Not merely saying that we were a Christian, but whether or not we're really living out the principles as delineated by Jesus of Nazareth. And so the religious leaders, they missed the whole point. And so they were murmuring with themselves, why do they eat with publicans and sinners? And so this is what evoked this trilogy, these three parables. And in Luke 15, there are actually three parables that culminate with the big one that we know is the prodigal of the lost son. I suggest there's a misnomer. It's really the prodigal of a loving father. We'll talk about that next week. But Jesus packs these three parables together in response to their scathing criticism as to why he was fraternizing with publicans and sinners. And again, they underscore here, they said, and that he eats with them. And I talked about that last week, right? For a Jew to have a meal with somebody, it meant that it had to be cooked a certain way, prepared a certain way. And these religious people, they had to be cleansed and go through a certain protocol before they could eat. And they say, this guy will eat with anybody. So he spoke these parables to them. Now watch what he does. He was the master teacher. If you look at the details, you really could see only the intelligence and the genius of God could weave in certain specific details in a parable to say, how in the world could you pack so much information in such a marvelous economy of words? The first thing he does, he draws them in emotionally. Look at what he does. He says, what man of you? He didn't start with himself. He didn't start with, with what, what he believes or what his philosophy is, his religious doctrine, his teaching, his ideology. He's going to teach them this biblical principle. He draws them in emotionally and psychologically. He said, I'm going to talk about something, and I want to put you right in the middle of the story. What man of you? He didn't even say, what shepherd among you? 
He made it generic. What man does a woman use? It owned livestock, and the primary livestock a lot of people owned was sheep. They had invested in sheep because of the money it eventually generated uh, from its fur, uh, from its meat, etc. What man of you having a hundred sheep? If he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which lost until he finds it. So the sheep now is, is ignorantly lost. The sheep could have been carelessly lost. But the sheep are known as being dumb animals, and therefore a sheep being lost, the some responsibility fell back on the sheep owner. He says, so even you, without saying even you, if you lost one of your sheep because of the financial investment that you have in your sheep and the financial return that could come from the sum of that sheep's furs and the sum of that sheep's meat, you would go out and find your sheep. This is the genius of Jesus of Nazareth, and this must be the genius of, of the church. The genius of Jesus of Nazareth and the church and the teaching of the scripture is that we got to bring people in it to where they can see themselves in it and they see that the Bible applies to real life in real time. So now he's got them in now. Psychologically, he's got them in. Emotionally, he's got them in. 99, and he also gives them the opportunity to be somewhat of a hero. You go out into the hedges, into the highways, you would risk, risk life and limb to try to find that one sheep. He gives them an opportunity to be a hero, and he says, you're not so cold and callous and so sadistic that you wouldn't care, and if you found the little sheep, you would pick the little sheep up, and you wouldn't beat him and excoriate him and whoop the sheep. Instead, you'd pick him up, and you'd wrap him around your shoulders. Even though you're tired and you're weary, you wouldn't allow to put a sheep on a leash. You put him on your shoulders and you bring the little lost sheep back home. Oh, he's bringing them in for the kid. Even you would do that. And when you got back home, you'd call your friends and you'd call your neighbors. And you'd say, y'all come and rejoice with me. I done found my little sheep that was lost. And now he's found. And I brought him or her back home and they're back in the sheepfold, why don't you come and rejoice with me? And then he says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven, verse 7, over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now, I'm not Jesus of Nazareth, so I can't set this thing up. I can't help you to see how he set them up and he didn't set them up by talking about religion. He set them up about talking about sheep that was lost and trying to find them and, and being concerned about something that you've lost and really near and you're trying to get it. And then you, you find it and you rejoice over and you bring it back home and rejoice with your family. And then he goes in, he says now, in heaven, in heaven, there is a cosmic party that is thrown. There is celebration, there is joy in heaven when one sinner repents, more than the 99 that need no repentance, he was not demeaning the 99, but the 99 were safe. They were already in the sheepfold. They were already being protected. But God places a premium and a value. God conducts a search, rescue, and delivery mission looking for sinners. <laughs> and that's what Ben Tolliver taught me. What Ben Tolliver taught me that if we're going to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ, we got to go to the holes, to the water holes, to the fishing holes, where we have an opportunity to encounter those that are lost and that desperately need the gospel. And there are people all up the socioeconomic ladder that need to be saved, so we need fishing holes at every porter. We need fishing holes in every place. We need them down at the Capitol. There needs to be a fishing hole down there. And there's a, there's a brother, a good friend of this church. His, his parents were friends of this church. And he has a ministry where he tries to work with legislators with prayer meetings and Bible study. That's a good There's a need for a fishing hole down there. Because the legislature sometimes looks like Shutter Island. <laughs> you see some of the movies. So if you haven't seen the movie, you need to go. You need to watch the movie Shutter Island. I've been seeing Shutter Island. I, I can recommend this one. I can tell this one because Sister Terrell is already saw it. <laughs> Shutter Island stars my man Leonardo DiCaprio. 
And he's an FBI agent, one of the top of the FBI men. And he's on this incredible cape in this insane asylum that's built on Shutter Island for violently insane individuals. And he's trying to track the case of this mysterious disappearance and this mysterious death. And he's going to crack this case and he's going to unturn everything he possibly can. And he's living there in Shutter Island with those people. They take you on a suspenseful ride. When you get to the end of the movie, the problem is you don't realize that he is the most insane person in the house. He is the most insane, and the doctors and the psychiatrists are actually letting him work all this stuff off my man Ben Kinslow. He's a psychiatrist there. He believes he can bring him back to reality. But he's too far gone. And I told him, the secretary is up there in the Senate President's office, let me get out of here out of Shutter Island before I get locked up. I see these people up here are insane. They think they got all the sense in the world. They not listen to nobody. They can't nobody tell them nothing. And they don't realize up in here, they're on Shutter Island under this big dome. It's insane. Some people say they're talking about, let me get up out of here. So you got my movie recommendation this week, Shutter Island. And so as I bring, bring the message home here this morning, Jesus uses these parables to try to reach the Pharisees, the chief priests and the scribes who were on Shutter Island. They were on spiritual Shutter Island. They thought that they were the spiritual sine qua non. They thought that they were the spiritual elite, the most righteous in the town, could quote all the scriptures by heart, knew all the details, did the tithes and the offering, the mint, the coming, and the spices, lived outwardly righteous and religious, but on the other hand, they're allowing widows' houses to be foreclosed on so they can get the proceeds. And they did not realize how far away they were from the living God. And Jesus is trying to wheel them back in. He tries to, he tries to get them connected in emotionally, talking about sheep that was lost and find them and having a party and then rejoicing and get them to try to realize the people that you despise the most, that you are rejected, that you think don't have a chance with God, those are the ones who sent me to save. And he sent out a seek, rescue, save, and deliverance mission to try to find the sinners. And every time one repents, there's a cosmic party in heaven. And then he tells them one more parable to try to draw them a little bit closer. He's talking to the domestic, to the women who are married to these people and other women who are there. He says, what woman among you if she had ten coins? And some of the Bible scholars they would suggest that maybe these ten coins was in some type of a headdress that many of the young brides would receive at marriage. It would be something they would treasure, and they would have these coins in them or some type of medallions, and they would really treasure it. And very possibly that could have been uh, an illustration Jesus was using. But, but, but the point he, he was making here is that this is something that is near and dear to this, this woman. The coin is lost in the house. It could have been accidentally lost. It could have been carelessly lost. But lost is still lost. And it was lost in the house. And I believe subliminally beneath that what Jesus was saying, you can be in the house but still be lost. You can be in the church and still be lost. You're in the temple and still lost. In the synagogue and still lost. Serving in high places and still lost. He says, so the coin was lost inside the house, but this woman knew it was in there, so she lit a candle, and she tore the house upside down, dusting places she had never dusted in a while, looking to find that coin, and when she found it, she said, would she not call her friend? Would she not send out a text or Instagram? Would she not send out an email? Do some FaceTime, whatever they're doing now. <laughs> Tell somebody, look what I done found. Now, you know, if it was a sister, now she would have put that thing on Facebook. <laughs> it would have been on Facebook. It would have been there when it was lost, and she would have said, this is the one that's lost, and if it show up in your pocketbook, bring it back. 
bring it back. I know it just jumped up in there, but bring it back. It's mine, and here's where it goes. And when she found it, she would have put up there, and she would have posted. It was lost, but now it's found, and she would rejoice. What the Lord is trying to get the Pharisees to see, don't you understand, that God is emotionally and psychologically and spiritually connected with human beings. That God is concerned about the eternal state and the state of human beings, and God has sent me to seek and to save that which was lost. And God rejoices, and the angels rejoice, and the heavens rejoice when one sinner repents. I believe that the church, we got to rediscover our identity by finding us some fishing holes near to where we work and play and recreate and going through our inventory of all of our contacts that we got in our phones and all the email contacts we got and all these people we know, many that we know that don't know the Lord in some case or maybe have drifted away from the commitment not connected to the church and we got to be like the shepherd or the man looking for the lost sheep, we got to be like the woman looking for the lost coin, and we got to be reaching out to people. And it may surprise you. They may respond with an affirmative. And they might show up. Verse 10, as we close. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels, of the angels of God, over one sinner who repents. And as I close, I bring your attention to a slightly different phrasing of that in verse 7. In verse 7, he says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy, right? There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And then in verse 10, he says, Likewise, I you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so I believe the illustration in verse 10, he's pointing to the fact that that joy in the presence of the angels, that joy is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In verse 10, he says, in the presence of the angels. As the angels are there worshiping and praising God, and they see the joy that is brought to the heart of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of one more sinner that has repented. One more sinner that's going to be a part of the bride that will be given to Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's joy in the presence of God. So as we go out trying to get people to come to church, inviting people to church, trying to win people to Christ, what should motivate us is that we got an opportunity to bring joy to the heart of God. Joy in the presence of the angels as God uses us to reach people with Christ, for Christ. Amen? Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, it's our desire to bring joy to your heart.